Example 8 is dealing with a potter's wheel. And you can see over here in a diagram of a potter who is uh, shaping some pottery. And that piece of pottery is being placed on that little disc over here. Now, back in the day, potter wheels were driven by uh, a foot treadle. But nowadays, we use electric motors. So this disc is being um, accelerated initially by a motor until it reaches its maximum rotational speed of 80 revolutions per minute. So in part A, we're asked to determine the moment of inertia of the potter's wheel. So let's go ahead to that. So I is the symbol we use for rotational inertia. And that's equal to what? Well, we're looking for the rotational inertia of a solid uniform disk. So we need to go back in the notes and look for that. So if you examine our shapes, our common geometric shapes, you'll see that this over here on the top right is the rotational inertia for a solid disk or a cylinder. It's given by I equals one half mR squared. That's assuming that it's rotating about the center of its axis. So I equals one half mR squared, and we're going to be substituting in our values. So m is the mass of the wheel, which is given as 40 kilograms. And the radius of this wheel, now the diameter is 0.5 or 50 centimeters, so the radius will be half of that, which is 0.25 meters. And that's being squared. So when you plug that into your calculator, you should get 1.25 kilograms times meter squared. OK, so we've determined the rota rotational inertia of a solid disk. So this is kind of a just quick picture of our solid disk. And it's rotating about the axis and increasing in angular velocity. So part B. It's asking you to determine the torque during this time period of 1.28 seconds where it goes from rest and reaches this maximum rotational speed of 80 RPM. So my first inclination in this is, well, torque is really R times F times sine theta. However, I'm not given any kind of force, uh, and that's not going to work out. So what can we do? Some of the torques, maybe. If you recall Newton's second law, F equals ma, but we want to do it for the rotational version. So that would be the sum of the torques instead is equal to I, the rotational inertia, multiplied by alpha, which is the angular acceleration. I'm looking at that because I already know the rotational inertia now from part A. I just need to find this angular acceleration. So how are we going to determine the angular acceleration? You see, we're, we're given the rotational speed, and we're given the time. Hopefully you recall the definition of angular velocity, or ang sorry, angular acceleration, is the change of the angular velocity, omega, divided by the change in time. So that's the final angular velocity minus the initial angular velocity at time 0 divided by t minus t sub 0. So at time 0, which is 0, we happen to have a 0 angular velocity because we assumed that it started from rest. So really, if we need to find the angular acceleration, we just need to take the angular velocity and divide it by the time interval. And do we know the angular velocity? Well, we do know the rotational speed is 80 RPM. But is that what we substitute into there? No, because remember, angular acceleration is in radians per second squared, and this is in revolutions per minute. So 80 revolutions per minute, which we're going to need to convert that to actually radians per second. So if you recall, in one revolution, we have 2 pi rads. And then in one minute, we have 60 seconds. So we want to find the angular velocity 
in radians per second, we're going to take 80, multiply by 2 pi, and then divide by 60. That's going to give you an answer of 8.38 rads per second. So let's go ahead and plug that into here. So the angular acceleration is 8.38 rads per second squared. Well, that's what we're going to get. We're divided by the time, which is 1.28 seconds. So alpha will be equal to. Uh, six point five oh let's say four five rads per second squared. So we're now ready to input that into over here. So our net torque will be one point two five kilograms times meter squared multiplied by six point five four five rads per second squared. I'm leaving out the units because I don't quite have enough space there. And this gives you an answer of a net torque of 8.18, roughly, Newton meters. And now, I'm not sure if it's positive or negative because they don't really tell us what direction it's rotating. So let's just leave it as a positive. Let's assume that it's accelerating in the counterclockwise direction. Okay, moving on to part C now. We need to find uh, the work done by the motor. And if you recall, in the earlier section we talked about work. When we look at rotational work, it's really the product of the torque multiplied by the angle. So we already know the torque, we just need to find that angular displacement. So it's equal to tau multiplied by delta theta. So what we'll need to do is find delta theta. We already know the torque is 8.18 that we got in part B. So delta theta, if you recall, theta equals theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. So delta theta, which is theta minus theta naught, is equal to omega naught, which turns out to be zero, plus one half alpha t squared. So one half times the angular acceleration of 6.545 rads per second squared multiplied by a time of 1.28 seconds, that quantity squared. And that should get us an answer of 5.36 rads, or radians. So now we can plug that into over here. Our work will be the torque, which is 8.18 multiplied, that's in newton meters by the way, multiplied by my angle 5.36 in rads. And that gets you an answer of 43.8649. So I'm just going to round that off to 43.9. Um, and this is in joules, because it's the amount of work. So this is, by the way, a capital W, not angular frequency. Okay, let's move on to part D. And part D is asking you to find the change in the rotational kinetic energy, so delta K. And if you recall, rotational kinetic energy is very similar to translational kinetic energy, which is one half mv squared, but for rotational kinetic energy, it's one half times I times omega squared. So it's one half times I omega squared that's to say the final angular velocity uh, minus one half i times omega squared but that's the initial angular velocity but the initial angular velocity is zero so therefore the whole kinetic energy initially is zero so really to find the change in kinetic energy we just simply need to multiply the rotational inertia i which is 1.25 kilograms times meter squared multiplied by the angular velocity of 8.38 rads per second squared 
or rads per second that all of that is being squared. And you get an answer of 43.8649 or 43.9 and you'll notice that this answer and this answer are identical. Why are these two answers the same? Why do you think so? Well, it should make sense. The work that is done is equal to the change in energy. In this case, it's only gaining kinetic energy. That's really the work energy theorem. W equals the change in kinetic energy. So therefore, 43.9 joules of work was done and 43.9 joules of kinetic energy was gained, rotationally speaking. Okay, part uh, E, how many revolutions does the wheel make? So we found earlier the angular displacement of 5.36 radians. So what we need to now find is just convert that essentially to revolutions. So that should be relatively straightforward. Delta theta is really 5.36 rads. So if we want to convert this into revolutions, we're just simply going to multiply by, hmm, well we want rads on the bottom, right? So multiply by two pi rads because that's what one revolution is. So if we multiply by one revolution per two pi rads, the rads will cancel out and we're going to end up with an answer that's in revolutions. And that gets you an answer of 0.8 five, three, 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 repeating basically, revolutions. So that's how much revolutions you make. Not quite one revolution, but 0.853 of a revolution. Okay, last part, part F. So we're trying to find the power. There's a couple ways of doing that. Um, if we just go back to our regular definition of power, which is the rate of using energy up, or the rate of doing work, it's the change in energy divided by the change in time. So the change in energy is really, well, it's changing in kinetic energy divided by that time. So our kinetic energy was 43.9. 43.9 joules divided by 1.28 seconds. And that gets us an answer of 34.269. So we'll just round that off to 34.3 joules per second, or you can write it as 34.3 watts. Now, is that the only way you can do it? I'm hoping that you might look at the earlier page, and you can see that rotational power can also be calculated by using power equals torque multiplied by the angular velocity. So you could solve this as power equals torque multiplied by the angular velocity omega. Now be very careful with this because there's the tendency of say take the torque of 8.18 .8, uh, newton meters, so it's the torque, and then multiplying by the angular velocity of 8.38 and you'll get an answer of 87.7 you know, watts, but that's like twice the answer. That's not right. So what's, what's, what's going on? What's, why is this wrong? Remember that the thing is starting to spin and spin and spin at a increasing and increasing angular velocity. So really this power is not really constant. It's actually continuously to increase. The power, if you look at it, over time is looking something like this. It's a linear relationship. So what you're really finding is not the power for the whole time period. It's not a constant value. It's increasing. So at the very beginning it has no power. And as you go faster and faster you're going to get more and more and more power. So really this power that you're getting is not the end power, not the beginning power. It's really the average power. So this is really an average power. This is really an average power. The torque is remaining the same but the angular velocity is increasing, so you should be using the average angular velocity. So this is wrong. That's why this is wrong. We need to change that. We need to find the average angular velocity. Well, the average angular velocity, since it's continuously increasing at a linear rate, is going to be really just the middle one. So really take this angular velocity of 8.38 and divide by 2.
And so when you divide that by 2 and multiply by your torque, you're going to end up with an answer of 34.3 watts, which is consistent with what we did in the other method. Okay, that's it for this example.